Amen. Are you ready for the word of the Lord? If you are this evening, we are looking at Proverbs chapter 19. We're going to read for us Proverbs 19, verse 24, all the way to chapter 20, verse 13. And that's what the word of the Lord says. A sluggard buries his hand in the dish. He will not even bring it back to his mouth. Flock a mocker, and the simple will learn prudence. Rebuke the discerning, and they will gain knowledge. Whoever robs their father and drives out their mother is a child who brings shame and disgrace. Stop listening to instruction, my son, and you will stray from the words of knowledge. A corrupt witness mocks at justice, and the mouth of the wicked gulps down evil. Penalties are prepared for mockers and beatings for the backs of fools. Wine is a mocker and beer a brawler. Whoever is led astray by them is not wise. A king's wrath strikes terror like the roar of a lion. Those who anger him forfeit their lives. It is to, the, it is to one's honour to avoid strife and every fool is quick to quarrel. Sluggards do not plow in season, so at harvest time they look but find nothing. The purpose of a man of a person's heart are deep waters, but one who has insight draws them out. Many claim to have unfailing love, but a faithful person who can find. The righteous lead blameless lives, blessed are their children after them. When a king sits on his throne to judge, he winnows out all evil with his eyes. Who can say, I have kept my heart pure, I am clean and without sin? Deferring weights and deferring measures, the Lord detests them both. Even small children are known by their actions, so is their conduct really pure and upright? Ears that hear and eyes that see, the Lord has made them both. Do not love sleep or you will grow poor. Stay awake and you will have food to spare. But this evening we are looking at the theme of work. But in particular, we are looking at its opposite actually. So Proverbs introduced to us to a very tragic character whose life ends up in ruin, whose life is messed up at the end and the name of this character is the sluggard, the lazy bum, if you would. And it's referred to, the word sluggard is referred to 14 times in the book of Proverbs. Twice in just those few verses that we have just read earlier on. So note, now that this, note that this tragic character is oftentimes the sluggard is presented in comic terms when he's being described. For example, Proverbs 19 tells us, the sluggard buries his hand in the dish and will not even bring it back to his mouth. Take in this picture. Here is a sluggard sitting down at the dining table. The food is put onto the fork. right? The, the, the food is actually served right in front of him and he loads all his delicious stuff already onto the fork. Right? But that is as far as he will get. Lifting up the fork to his mouth is just too much an effort for this man. Some of us think, that's not describing me, man. Right? Then we read, as the door hinges, turns on his hinges, so does a sluggard on his bed. What is this Proverbs telling us? See, the problem with the sluggard is not just that he likes to lie on bed or lie in the bed. He is hinged to the bed. He turns one way, he turns the other. But for him, this sluggard, he wouldn't get up. So here, the sluggard is described as one who is full of excuses. He is adverse to all kinds of risks. And he always has a reason for not doing the work that needs to get done. Proverbs 22 tells us, the sluggard says, there's a lion outside. I shall be killed in the streets. So I better don't go out. Better don't go out. 
So when we read Proverbs like this, right, we are meant to just smile and laugh, which many of us have done so far. But Proverbs like this are really meant to make us think. They are meant to get us to ponder about our lives. They are meant to help us recognize the danger of being lazy. Learn that this evening. But I'm sure, I've got no doubt, that all of us sitting here this evening, all of us work very hard. We are all very hard working, so there may be a temptation for us to think, that it's not for me. This verse is for my wife. This verse is for my husband. This verse is for who? This verse is for who? And all that. But just not too fast, my friend. There is always something for us to learn today, no matter how hard working we all may declare ourselves to be. So the, the wise man does give us the profile of an unproductive worker or an unproductive person. So this is on us to begin by looking at this profile. What does an unproductive person look like? What are some of the marks and characteristics? First of all, he is someone who is slow to start. Proverbs 20 tells us the, the sluggard does not plough in the autumn. He will seek at harvest and have nothing. Kosong. Right? So here the Proverbs draw us, draw our attention to the long-term effects of putting off things that we need to be doing now. In the, in the farming terms and all that, there's always a season for ploughing and there's a season for sowing and there's a season for reaping. The season that requires the most work is really the season of ploughing. And ploughing is really hard work. And here, the sluggard does not want to do all the hard work. And the context is very important for us to understand. So when God's people first came into the promised land, when they first came into Canaan, every family was given a plot of land after they have settled down in the land of Canaan. And God gave them homes they did not build. God gave them wells they did not dig. God gave them vineyards they did not plant. So here God gave them the means. All the means for self-sustenance were already provided for them. Everything they need for life was already theirs. And it was all given freely, generously, right? By the grace and the abundance of God. So their part was to work the fields that God has given them to do. So working the fields that God has given was the work that God has called them or God has called His people to do. But here, the sluggard is slow to stand. He does not plough in the autumn. So when the harvest comes, all of his neighbours will just bring, are bringing all the grains of, of rich produce from the land that will sustain them in the months to come. But the sluggard here has nothing. One of the stories that I enjoy reading to my grandchildren, and I've read them many times right now, is that story of the ants and the grasshopper. And I suspect that this wonderful story has its roots, right, in the book of Proverbs. So here, the Proverbs 6 tells us, Go to the end, O sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise. Without having any chief, officer or ruler, she prepares her bread in summer and gathers her food in harvest. So here, these tiny little insects are wise enough to know that what we do now will affect or relates to what we will have in the future. So little ants know that they need to prepare for the future without any supervision. And here the wise men say, go and look at the ants and learn from them. They have much to teach us about hard work. So let them serve as an example to all of us. But here the unproductive person needs to be supervised all the time. But ants see what needs to be done and they get on with doing the job. But compared to these industrial ants, this sluggard simply refused to work or keep on delaying. So he postpones, he keeps on procrastinating. 
I'll get around doing it sometime. I'll get around doing it. I'll do my plowing tomorrow. I'll do it tomorrow. Of course, there is always a tomorrow, isn't it? So first, the profile of an unproductive person is someone who is slow to start. Secondly, he is easily distracted. Proverbs 28 tells us, whoever works his land will have plenty of bread, but he who follows worthless pursuits will have plenty of poverty. So what keeps the sluggard from doing the work that God has called him to do and stewarding that which God has entrusted to him? What keeps this, this sluggard from this is that he is quite easily distracted. He is one who, what we would say, he lacks focus. He, has, he follows worthless pursuit, pursuits. And of course, he's one who is fascinated with everything. Many things seem attractive to him. See, inevitably, at the end, because of all the distractions, he ends up achieving nothing. I don't know about you, but we live in a world that is just filled with constant distraction, isn't it? From the moment we wake up to the moment we lie down in bed, there are just so many things that will distract us. Facebook may dist distract you. Are you distracted by Netflix? What else are you distracted? Many of us are distracted by different things. So we live in a world that we are just constantly being tucked from all over, being distracted. And the reason this sluggard has nothing at, at harvest is that he refused to work, right? It's not that he refused to work. It's simply that he never quite get around doing what should be done. That's why Proverbs 6 tells us, How long? How long will you lie down, O sluggard? When will you arise from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands, to rest. Notice the word, just a little sleep. He says, I'll get around, I will get around to do the plowing when I'm ready. But right now, right now, sky is still tampo dark. Give me a little more sleep, just a few more hours, 10 more minutes or whatever. I'm not even talking about sleep, I'm talking about little snooze. Just a short nap, just a short nap, or just a few minutes will do, see? Then I'll get it done. I'll get it done. Sounds familiar, huh? But after that comes another distraction. See, I'll just do this first. Then I'll get around to do the plowing. Oh, let me just settle that first. Then I'll get to, get to do the plowing and all that. So this person simply makes too many excuses, too many postponements in a sense, too many delays. Little by little, it's just a little folding of the arms and our whole life may just slip away. So because of that, the sluggard has no harvest. Not because he makes some grand decision not to plough, but because through a thousand small concessions, distractions, excuses of the flesh, as a result, he never got around to doing what God had called him to do. So first, he's slow to start. Secondly, he's easily Distracted. The third thing about an, a, an unproductive person is someone who does not finish. Proverbs 12 tells us, Whoever is slothful or lazy will not rose his game, but the diligent man will get precious wealth. So clearly, this person who is slow to start and is easily distracted, of course, he wouldn't get to be able to finish. So here, the, the sluggard does get started. He finds some food and he brings it home. After he brings the food home, he lost interest in a sense. He caught a beautiful, wow, fantastic, great chicken, but he wouldn't go around to just cooking it and enjoying the food. So the pattern of this person's life, right, is that he is always moving on to something else. Something new catches his eye and off he goes. And, and, and leaving behind him a trail of things that he started but never quite get to finish. So things that he started that, did, that he did not continue and never completed because he did not get to work on them. As a result, that brings him, of course, to the fourth point, 
the fourth mark of an unproductive person, he never rests. Earlier on, we read about the sluggard is hinged to his bed, right? So that sounds a little bit surprising. So the person who keeps on putting off what needs to be done, well, is someone who can never rest, to be honest. You may be in bed, but you turn to the left, you turn to the right, you turn to the left, you turn to the right, you push a blanket one way, push a blanket, blanket the other way, at the end of the day, it's already 4.30. Then you're still not awake. So he knows what he needs to do. He keeps on thinking about what he needs to get done. And at the back of his mind, he knows he has not finished. And because of that, he doesn't rest. On the contrary, we read that God rested when he has completed his work. And the price of putting off what God has called us to do is that we will never get to rest no matter how long you lie on your bed. Proverbs 13 tells us, the soul of the sluggard craves and gets nothing, while the soul of the diligent is richly supplied. Notice that this proverb is talking about the soul of a person. Not only the bands of the sluggard are empty, the soul of the sluggard is empty as well. And the reason is this. Laziness will empty our wallet, but it will do even something worse as well. Laziness will hollow out our soul because constant voiding what God has called us to do is actually very hazardous to our soul. That's why the soul of the sluggard craves. He, he really wants to have a harvest too, right? But he won't do. He won't, he won't do what, get what needs to be done. So he ends up getting nothing. And he would like to be like his neighbor who has a lot in the harvest, but he won't do what he has to do to get what his neighbors are having. So no one wants to be like the sluggard. But his profile does give us a very helpful greed, a helpful formula, a, a, a kind of a, a, a formula to, to understand what does it take? What does it take for us to become a productive person? What does it take for us to get things done? So in the light of the profile of an unproductive person, these are four very good questions for us to ponder, to help us to become productive. All right? What do I need? What do I need to be gained? Where do I need to stay focused? What do I need to complete? And what do I need to rest? Very good and helpful questions to help us to become more productive as a person. So first, we look at the profile of an unproductive person. The next thing to, I want us to do is to look at the motive. What motivates a hard-working person. Proverbs 24 has this to say, I pass by the field of a sluggard, by the vineyard of a man lacking sense. And behold, behold, it was all overgrown with thorns. The ground was covered with nettles, and his stone wall was broken down. That's a picture, or picture with me. Picture with me a, a wise person taking a walk in the countryside. The path leads him through the edges or through the edge of a one small farm after one after another. And as this person walked along this country road with farms of, or farms all over, on the left and on the right, it was, on the right, it was a beautiful walk. So picture this wise man first walking by a field that is full of ripening corns. Wow! And as he looks across the field, he sees, he sees a little house of the person who owns this field that is ripe with ripening corns. And he says to him, it's going to be a good harvest when it comes the time for harvest. And those people living in that house will be blessed. In the same way, he walked past a vineyard and saw, wow, great, with classes of grapes hanging over. And he thinks, uh, this household is going to be blessed. One farm, and then finally he comes to a, pov a, a poverty, a, pov a, po a property, 
a property that looks entirely different. In this, in this property, the, the field is overgrown with thorns. The fields is the ground is covered with nettles, and the stone wall of it uh, that surrounds the field is broken down. So here, God has given to this person who owns this field, but this person does not use what God has given to him. And the tragedy of a field that is given to us by God, a field that is neglected, is not just that if you are lazy, it's not only that we will fail to provide for ourselves. The tragedy is that we are not able to contribute, to share what we have with others. Look at what the wise man said in Proverbs 21. He said, the desire of the sluggard kills him, for his hand refused to labor. All day long, he craves and craves. But contrast this, but, but the righteous gives. The righteous gives and never hold back. i like us to look at this proverb and to be able to contrast in this verse, is a contrast between the, the sluggard and the righteous person. So here's the difference. The righteous has a good harvest, and so he is able to give to others. He is able to give, and he does not hold back. In short, because he is blessed much, he is generous in a sense, but the sluggard who did not plow has nothing to give. So understand this, what we have been given, biblically, if we understand it right, it's not just we spend for ourselves. But in this case, what God has given has been ignored by the person who is lazy. Not only does he crave and crave, is not able to give generously. So here God gave the sluggard a field that would produce all that he needed for himself and more so that he can share that with others. But here the sluggard does not use what God has, has trusted to him, what God has given to him in a sense. So here the field becomes overgrown and the walls are broken down. But right here in the book of Proverbs, particularly between the contrast between the righteous and the sluggard, is for us a seed principle, a very important principle that is drawn out for us as God's children. And that is also worked out, right, in the whole of the New Testament as well. And what is that principle? Love. Love is the great biblical principle, the motive, the motive for our work. Why do we work? It is motivated by love. Look at what Ephesians say, says. Paul says in Ephesians 4, Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with another in need. If you are not in the habit of looking around, us and see if there are people who are in need, that we can be a blessing. I want us to open our eyes this evening that biblically there is that principle. Yes, God has given us what we don't deserve. He has given us wells we did not dig, vineyards we did not plant, houses we did not build. He has given that to us because He's generous and gracious to bless us because we are His children. But if you work at it and when the Lord blesses us, He will always give us more. And when He gives us more, it is meant for us to be able to share. Can we learn that together? Can we see that and begin to say, Lord, teach me to understand what this means. So the motive for using the gifts that God has given to us is not simply that we will have what we need. It is so that we will be able to contribute to the needs of others. Look at the epistles of Paul. The poorer, the poorer churches are receiving help from those churches that can afford. And those who do not think they are very rich, they are, given, they are giving more. They are giving sacrificially so that others who are in need will be blessed and have a reason to give thanks. 
So the motive for our work is such that we will have something to, to be able to share. So love is the great motive for all of our work. And it begins with our love. It begins with our love for God. It really does. Here at Colossians, Paul goes on to tell us in Colossians, whatever you do, whatever you do work, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord and not men. In fact, these words from Colossians ought to be a verse that is always hidden within our heart. So we would normally, we would normally serve the Lord with great joy. Most of us serve God with great joy, but not every day is joyful, isn't it? Someday you don't feel like coming to serve this or to serve that. Some days are just not good. Some days we do struggle. But on days that we do struggle, we can remind ourselves, Lord, whatever I'm struggling, I'm offering it to you because, Lord, you love me first. I'll offer it to you as an expression of worship and as an expression of my love for you. That's one way of doing it. That you are, whoever we serve, I'll, I'll be honest with you, not everybody we serve, we enjoy serving. There are some people who are just not appreciative. There are some people who just bot up or don't care and all that. Do we stop serving them? Do we stop loving them? No, given we are working in the flesh, we would. But if we really have the love for God and we have the love of God, we can say, Lord, I'm doing it not because I really enjoy it or like to, but because I love you. I will do it gladly. I'll do it happily. I'll offer it to you as the expression of my love. So whatever our work is, offer that to God as a worship. Offer that to God as an expression of our love for Him. Right, Lord, I'm doing this exam. Lord, for you. Lord, I'm bearing with this unbearable person. Lord, for your sake. So sometimes it's like that. There'll be, there'll be times we would rather be doing something else, but we'll be helped and we'll be lifted up when, God, when we say to God, God, help me to learn how to offer what I'm doing as my love for you. So whatever our work, love has to be the great motive for pursuing all that God has called us to do. Hard work is not easy. Hard work is not necessarily enjoyable. Some, some are, but not, hard, not all hard work are really easy or enjoyable in a sense. This person by the name of Rebecca de Jong, he, she, she wrote a, a book on the se seven deadly sins and she described this. She describes laziness as, as resistance, as resistance to the demands of love. Have you ever thought about that? That laziness is really resistance to the demands of love. And to love is not natural. It takes a lot to love, isn't it? It takes a sacrifice. It takes hard work to love. And what she says affects, relates to all relationships with all people, but she described it in the context of a marriage. Right? You see, it can, easily, it can easily happen in a marriage. Imagine a husband and a wife. They end up getting into an argument, end up getting into a shouting war. And what happens? They stop talking. One turn one way, one turn another. When it's time to sleep, lagi chalat. They don't sleep in the same bed. One go to one room, the other one go to the other room, and they don't talk. Wait and see who says sorry first. Sometimes for weeks later. Nobody says sorry. So think of a relationship like that, that we have, not just between husband and wife, with very good friends, with a sibling, with a parent. It is easy to stay at a miserable distance instead of being willing for the sake of love. If you ask this couple, right, do they want this relationship? Most of the time, yes. They do want the relationship. Yes, they do. But do they want to do what it takes, right? to be in that relationship? Maybe tomorrow. Lah. <laughs> Not now. Not now. So at least for now, both husband and wife, they just want the night off to wallow in their whatever, self-righteousness or, or, or <laughs> what, what have you. So she said this, 
it is easy to get lazy in love, to take any relationship for granted and to let it drift because, because we can't be bothered to face what is really wrong and make the effort to try and put it right. It is a great sin to let love die because we are too lazy to do the hard work it takes to keep it alive. It's an excellent principle in a marriage, but I find that it's true for any relationship. And in particularly in a marriage relationship, it is so true, isn't it? We just make do, we just get along, and we know that there are cracks in the walls. There are things that divide us, but we are simply too lazy because to sit down and to address something, may it be housework, may it be children, may it be finances, may it be work or whatever, do we have the willingness to say, I am prepared to work? As I said last week, it's not easy to say I'm wrong. It's not easy to say I'm sorry. It's not easy to say, please forgive me. That takes hard work. And laziness is a resistance to the demands of love because love demands. Love demands effort from both parties. Someone may say, no point. Lah. No point. Nothing I do ever work in that sense. Or well, sometimes it may be true for the now. But like what Paul says in Galatians, right? Let what Paul says, hmm, I'll skip this. Let what Paul says, in Galatians, encourages. He says, let us not grow weary of doing good. Let us not grow weary for doing what is right, what is important, what is needful. For in due season, we will reap if we do not give up. It applies to our spiritual life as well. Take a look honestly into our life. In terms of our walk with God, the demands of God on, upon our life as His children. Right? Where are there sins that need to be confessed? Where do the broken walls of trust need to be repaired? Where have we neglected the care that God has called us to give, the work that He has called us to do? Repentance is like plowing. It takes hard work. But in due time, as Paul says, if we do not give up, we will reap a good reward. So it is a great sin to let love die because we are too lazy to do what it takes to keep that relationship alive. Relationship with God, our relationship with our spouse, with our children, with our siblings, relationships with our friends, loved ones, colleagues, what have you. Right? And it will be a tragic loss to miss eternal life when it comes to our relationship with God, if we are too lazy to do what it takes. So hard work is important. Look through your scriptures. Right? There is, there is a lot of verses that talks about putting in the effort. Look at this. Fight the good fight of the faith. Fight. Leh. You go in there, boom, 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 you're beaten. Fight. You've got to act on it. Be proactive. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you are called. Like strive, strive to enter through the narrow gate. There are few that walk through the narrow gate. You got to strive to make sure you are walking through the narrow gate. You just drift. You just go into the white, into the white gate. In that sense, then it says, "Do do not work for the food that perishes." That's the only one I tell you. No need to work. Those food, those things that perishes, mean so kang, lazy is all right. But for the food that endures to eternal life, which, right, which the Son of God will give to you, means work for them. Ask and you shall receive. You will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and you will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives and the one who seeks finds and to the one who knocks it will be opened. We need to do the work. We need to ask. We need to pray. That reminds me, next week, 
It's the third Saturday of the month. It is prayer meeting week. I'd like to see more hardworking people turning up next week. If not next week, I'll say, you, 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 nickname. I didn't say it. So don't be a lazy Christian. I want to grow my relationship with God. Make time for God. I want to really be able to hear God's voice. Make time to be quiet and be disciplined before Him. If you're not willing to work, thank you. And that's true. Unfortunately, that's true. But if you will not plow, forget about the harvest. First of all, we have seen the profile of an unproductive person. Then we have looked at the motive right, of a hardworking person. The next, last but not least, let's look at the joy of a Christ-like person. In short, we're looking at Jesus himself. Notice, all right, that Jesus begins early. He is exactly, he is exactly the opposite of everything that is described about the sluggard. The sluggard is slow to start. But at the age of 12, at the age of 12, Jesus was found already in the temple of God, talking with all the religious leaders. Right? He gave himself to the Father's business. And he did not, and he did it. He did it out of love, first for his Father. Second, he did it out of his love for us. Love what is motive. So is there something that God has prompted us to do that we have been putting off? Right? Have we been procrastinating? Have we been delaying? Telling ourselves that there's plenty of time? Have we become aware of our need to get right with God? and seek the new life that God has given to us. The author of the book of Hebrews says this correctly. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Let me tell you a secret. It's not that great a secret in a sense. The greatest deception that Satan would have us believe is that there is no hurry. No need to hurry la. What for so kanchong? It comes to our God. There's, there is no need, there is no urgency to take God seriously. There's no hurry to give our lives to the Lord. There's no hurry to fulfill the purpose of God in our life. In fact, the greatest deception in which the greatest deception is when men discover that there's such a thing called tomorrow. Every day there's a tomorrow. If you have not known that already, we tell ourselves tomorrow we will love God. Tomorrow we'll make our lives count for Jesus. Tomorrow we'll get our lives right with God. Tomorrow then I'll repent of my sin. Tomorrow we'll do that. And millions of people, many Christians have lived their life based on the basis that there is always a tomorrow. Tomorrow I'll do it. Brothers and sisters, delay. Delay is the most deadly form of denial. You can say anything you want, but you don't act on it. It doesn't, it doesn't mean anything. And delay is the most deadly form of disobedience. But now, now is a time for repentance. Now is a time for us to get, to get right with God. Now is a time for us to do what needs to be done. It's a fun time for us to start taking God seriously, to start obeying Him to so start pursuing His call in our life. So here, Jesus started early. Next, we notice Jesus stayed focused. The sluggard was so easily distracted, but there's an urgency about every day in the life of Jesus. He says in John 9, we must work the works of Him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. Now we listen to that from an old man, not necessarily wise. Here am I, a man who is in the 60s. I'm looking at the last phase of my life. I wish I'm in my 20s or 30s with a much longer runway. But brothers and sisters, don't wait till you are my age to decide it's time for me to get serious with God. You think you, you are only in your 30s, whatever, 
60, well, still got, it's only halfway there, plenty of time. Just a blink of your eye. Right? I'm in my 60s. I start looking at the obituaries. There are people dying at 68, people dying at 72. You think that's very long ago. For me, it is not, you know. I'm 62. 68 is how many more years? Six more years only. Leh. Have you thought about that? But you think you'll live to 68 even though you're 30. You never know. You never know. There is not always a tomorrow. Bear that in mind. So where in our life do we need to stay focused? All right? We better be focused. We hear Jesus set his face. Jesus set his face like a flint to go into Jerusalem. There are things that may sway him, but he is focused. So I pray that we will come to a point where we learn what we learn to be focused and we learn to be obedient no matter how much it costs us. So first, Jesus started early. Secondly, Jesus stayed focused. Thirdly, Jesus completed his work. In John 17, he says, I glorify you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. What was the work that God, Abba Father, gave to him? Well, Jesus came into the world to seek and to save the lost. And at that point, he has done it. Everything that is needed to bring us from where we are right now to the eternal joy of heaven has already been accomplished by Jesus when he finally go to the cross, when he died on the cross. That is why on the cross, just Jesus is able to say, it is finished. I pray, I pray that when we finally come to our deathbed, we can be so rested to say, Lord, by your grace, I've accomplished much of what you have entrusted to me. I pray we will not be on our deathbed and we wonder, wow, Tama, tama, tama. What am I going to say to God? And in the back of your mind, you know that there are things that the Lord has put on your heart to be doing. But we keep on delaying, keep on pushing it aside. We are distracted. We keep on giving excuses. Jesus completed his work. And of course, the last thing, Jesus entered his rest. Where is Jesus right now? Right now. He is seated at the right hand of the Father where He is ready and able to save all who look to Him in repentance and in faith. Jesus is, because He has finished, He is at rest. He has entered into the rest of His heavenly Father. So everything, everything, right? Everything that, that we see in a sluggard Jesus demonstrated the opposite. May it be that each of us and every one of us would become like Him. Why? Because there are work, there are good work that God has prepared for us to do. There are, there are people that He wants us to be reaching out to. There are people who are in need that He wants us to help. There are people who are lonely that He wants us to walk alongside them. There are people who are in trouble that He needs us to be, to be of help. Offer what we have. It's not about how great we are, how equipped we are. All that we need is what? Offer to the Lord our five loaves and two fish. That's all that is needful. Lord, whatever I have, Lord, I offer it to you. Lord, whatever you tell me to do, by your grace, Lead me to do it. And when we offer it to God, God can use you. God can use each of us to do remarkable things. Do you know that the parable of the feeding of the 5,000 with the five loaves and two fish, that is the only miracle that Jesus performed that, are, that is recorded in all four Gospels. It does not take a lot or much. It takes a willingness on our part to say, Lord, this is all I have. This is what you've entrusted to me. Lord, use it for your glory. You'll be surprised what God can do. So as you go into this week, Lord, as I start this week, I offer 
my whole week unto you. Lord, bring people into my life that you would like me to be a friend to, to, to serve, to love. Lord, whatever you have prepared for me, Holy Spirit, sensitize my spirit. Lord, if I'm lazy, kick me in the butt. Wake me up. Nudge me. Don't let me go until I respond to you in happy obedience. So start that. Do that at the beginning of the day. Do that at the beginning of the week. Do that for our whole life. Which is why Paul, at the end of his life, he's, he can say, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. I pray that that will be the posture of our heart so that we can really, truly enter into the rest of God. Because God's desire is for us to be at rest, to enter into His rest. And we can enter into His rest when we are surrendered, when we are willing. Father, we come before You and Lord, we humbly confess, left to our own, most of us behave very much like the sluggard. Lord, in varying degrees, Lord, what is said about him would be true about our life. So Lord, tonight we come humbly before you and ask that you awaken our spirit to see our life, to see the work you give to us from a totally different perspective. Lord, may we be found motivated because we have experienced your love. May we be found loving others with the love you have given to us. So Lord, fill our hearts with your love. Draw us closer to you that we will encounter your cross. So out of experiencing your love, we will learn to love others with the same way you have loved us. So that Father, we can be found to be doing, to be fighting a good fight and to be able to finish the race. So we humbly commit ourselves to you. We thank you that we are not alone. We thank you that you have the Holy Spirit that is with us and in us. We thank you that your grace is more than sufficient. So we want to rest in that, Lord. So we thank you, we bless you, for we humbly pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.